In today's episode of The Rundown, we're gonna to talk to you about one of the best e-commerce entrepreneurs on the planet, raising $500 million on a new food delivery startup. And we're gonna talk about Amazon's new $300 million podcasting deal. Stay tuned. It is Monday, January 4th, 2021. This is the Piper Rundown. We analyze business and culture to help you win. Today's rundown is presented by JetStore. JetStore has been providing affordable, reliable, and easy to manage data storage and cloud solutions to over 4,000 customers worldwide for over 26 years. JetStore offers storage systems for private cloud hosting, video surveillance, internet of things, AI, machine learning, edge computing, data archiving, HPC, media production, medical imaging, and flight simulations. For more details, visit JetStore.com. Thank you so much for sponsoring The Rundown. If you were to ask someone to talk about the preeminent entrepreneurs of the 2020s, perhaps even the late 1990s, uh, not 2020s, tw 2000s, yeah, 20 sorry. 2000s, 2000s, yeah. Uh, most people would say Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg. If they were a little more sophisticated, they might start talking about the second tier, uh, not necessarily in terms of less accomplishment, but just a little bit less acclaim, a Patrick Collison, a Katrina Lake. Less widely known. Mark Loy should absolutely be on that list, and if you clicked on the thumbnail for this video, you probably already have some inkling of who this man is, but I wanna quickly read off his last two entrepreneurial achievements, and then we'll set up why his third is potentially just as big, if not bigger. So Mark Lorre uh, founded Quidzy, which started diapers.com. He ended up selling that company to, for $500 million to Amazon. Now that was an especially big feat because Amazon didn't acquire many competing e-commerce companies at the time. They only had to acquire it because they could not beat diapers.com. He followed that up with yet another e-commerce e-commerce venture, Jet.com, which was uh, allowing you to pay less by buying more things and batching that together. And he sold that for $3.3 billion, billion. billion to Walmart in 2016 and is reportedly making over $750 million on that specific acquisition. Well, when you do a major acquisition like that and you are such an e-commerce savant like Mark Laurie, you have to sign a non-compete for five years. And that's what he did. He signed it in 2016 and in 2021, the gloves come off, mm -hmm. the shackles come off, his earnout is complete, so all that money is in his bank account securely. And what he will be moving on to is a company called Wonder. Wonder, incorporated as Food Truck Inc., is a stealth unicorn that has already raised $500 million in funding. Now, the reason that's happening is he made a lot of money with uh, for uh, his investors with Jet, with Quidzy. So Bain, GV, Excel, all these other players that have given money in the past were probably first in line to give him money yet again. And whether this is a home run, a triple, a double, they want to be in the Mark Laurie game. And it is a good place to be. Um, what this company is doing, Wonder, Food Truck Inc., is delivering food in high income suburbs outside of major metros. If that sounds familiar, you'll remember just one month ago, DoorDash IPO, we went at length to talk about how DoorDash had differentiated themselves by not focusing on in-city delivery, but by delivering to the suburbs where it's known that there is more disposable income, there is a greater premium on time and convenience, and fewer options than residents living in the city. So Mark Laurie is following a similar playbook, avoiding competition, going to the place where there is the greatest share of wallet to be attained. But unlike DoorDash, which is running a three-sided market marketplace between independent restaurants, independent dashers, and those customers, he is building a verticalized solution that integrates the delivery, mm -hmm. the food preparation, mm -hmm. very conveniently. The way that works is they have a fleet of hybrid electric vans. Inside those vans are heating trays, are basic tools for finishing the preparation of the food. In these trucks is not only a driver, but a professional chef who's doing the finishing touches on the preparation for these meals. So if you're thinking about this in your head, the potential to improve the quality of the food that would come to you in the form of delivery, as opposed to being in the place, is the fact 
that they, these independent restaurants, because it's a three-side marketplace, as soon as it leaves their door, they have no influence yeah. on the quality of the food. It's sitting in someone's passenger seat. It's sitting in someone's back seat. Things that are supposed to be crispy get soggy. Things that are supposed to be moist get dry. <laughs> I hate it when the moist stuff's dry. Um, and so this is aiming to fix that issue specifically. The finishing touches of preparation happen closer to final delivery. Um, and frankly, there's just the infrastructure within the actual moving vehicle to not only increase the quality of the food, but scale delivery. One of the harsh truths is with these independent dashers, once again, the three-side marketplace, those dashers that are moving the food from place to place, they max out at two to three deliveries per hour. There is no physical way to get them going where they need to go faster than that. These trucks, on the other hand, could be storing dozens of meals and potentially, because of some of those tools, be able to batch some of these deliveries together yep. and be significantly more efficient on the delivery end, which leads to the promise of more profitable, scalable food delivery. It's such an interesting model that frankly we really haven't seen before. Like it is surprising that since the existence of food trucks, no one has become like the go-to food delivery truck where they can make it make it all in the same spot, deliver it. it it's a great idea. Well, the other side of it is these are hybrid electric vehicles. So, so the other part of this is to charge and to yeah. keep driving around is gonna be a very, these are like sprinter vans, yeah. very different proposition than your standard food truck, okay. which is built to stop uh -huh. and then be the point of full prep. And it's vent free. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's so unique. And at first glance, I was looking at this and thinking, these margins are going to be even more razor thin than your typical cloud kitchen or delivery server, but it, it's, it's so not. Like they have all, all the equipment that they need on the truck. It is electric, so that's a huge difference between like fuel, fuel driven vehicles and whatnot. Yeah. And like depending on the neighborhoods, they are targeting these higher income suburbs that are Three, highly populated. Four, five person families. Exactly. That bigger are bigger ticket orders. Yeah, bigger ticket orders. And each plate I think is gonna be on average about fifteen dollars. Yep. So it's it's such a smart model and I for one am gonna be interested to see how quickly this gets rolled out around major cities or you know the higher populated higher income suburbs of major cities it's I, I can't imagine that it's going to be a particularly fast moving process. And it doesn't need to be. So they have a four, uh, 40,000 uh, 40, square foot commissary in Cranford, New Jersey. They're testing this in a very limited area of Westfield, New Jersey, only between, I think it's like the hours of 3.30 and 7.30 or something like that. So it's very, very contained. Yeah. And they're just trying to, as quickly as possible, iterate on the actual execution of this before they get a whole fleet, before they launch in every single city, get the model right, get the pricing right, yeah. and make sure their partners are happy. Because the other thing that's happening here is some folks don't want to have their food be delivered, or the, a lot of the high ends, a lot of the Michelin stars, you know, the, the Nick Kikonis, um, you know, uh, Michelin star type of restaurants, yes. they want to do it all themselves. So they 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 want to verticalize. They want that control. They're not willing to go on DoorDash and Uber and some of those other platforms. Yeah. And so what is happening is he's actually earned partnership not just from these great investors that did the $150 million seed round, the $350 million Series A, but they've also got Bobby Flay, yeah. Jonathan Waxman, these other top chefs to license their brands mm -hmm. to this endeavor because they buy into the idea that that quality will be up to the standards that they hold. Yeah, and Mark Lurie is known. You you inter interviewed um, the CEO of Urban Stems. He was speaking to how Mark Lurie is known for upholding customer quality standards and, and just no one else even comes close to matching the quality of customer service that he delivers. One of those brilliant people um, I've ever met. Um, and uh, his hypothesis about all of e-commerce can kind of be boiled down to one pretty simple thing. And that's if you create the best possible customer experience, you'll always win at the end of the day because you move the t two most important metrics in e-commerce. Um, 
you lower your cost of acquisition um, and you increase your lifetime value of the customer. Uh, and when those, when that gap grows bigger and bigger, you have a more and more profitable e-commerce company that can grow faster and faster. Absolutely. Very promising. Very interesting. Uh, they're hiring like crazy as you would with that amount of money. Uh, they've hired, you know, past employees from Jet, Walmart, uh, GoPuff, SeatGeek, all these, uh, all the, all these talent that know Mark Laurie, they know yep. the kind of potential upside, just like these investors are thinking. And uh, we will see how that plays out. I will absolutely 100% try it when it comes to Pittsburgh. Uh, our second story is Amazon buying Wondery for a deal valued at, very important, valued at $300 million. What is Wondery? It is in that same family of podcasting companies. We talked about a string of acquisitions in late 2018 and early 2019. Uh, Spotify getting The Ringer, getting Gimlet. Um, what was, what was it? Parcast. Parcast. Uh, a number of other acquisitions. Uh, Sirius also acquiring different podcasting companies. Amazon is really trying to scale out voice uh, with their Audible service offering. Uh, they do all sorts of kind of like free exclusive audio chapters there. It's tied into their play with Amazon Alexa. Alexa and the Echo speakers and all those device integrations. Mm -hmm. This is going to help them fill the pipes with more original content. Wondery produces shows like Dirty John, Dr. Death, Shrink Next Door, and a bunch of other shows that I don't listen to personally. Not my taste. Not my thing. You ever listen to those shows? I've listened to a handful of them. I remember listening to Dirty John so long ago, but they produce just a ton of... It, it's more along the lines of true crime and yeah, entertainment... Um, I don't know, trying to be entertainment, like type uh, of, exactly, with different which, actors and scripted shows. Which and fits with the Audible game plan, which totally. is very non-personality driven. Yes, exactly. But something that's interesting here is maybe this deal could get them to produce something more along the lines of the journal or the daily and have Amazon built, have that built into their model as well, because that is something that Wondery doesn't have currently, but with the new new deal, maybe maybe they will. Wondery raised $10 million back in July of 2019 at a $100 million valuation. The valued at $300 million, we, we've talked about this before with like, you know, uh, athlete contracts where the agent goes out and makes the biggest, splashiest, most amazing number ever. When in reality, that's like if every single bonus, every single incentive and KPI is hit, which is almost never the case. Part of the idea there is that you create some um, extensively lofty ones at the outside chance of hitting them. Um, so I would imagine a modest return for those last investors, but a nice return for Hernan Lopez. Speaking of Dirty uh, and Dirty John, the uh, former Fox exec will depart the company. He will not be part of Amazon. And I'm sure that Amazon does not necessarily want to associate themselves with someone who has been uh, allegedly uh, tried for bribing soccer officials associated with Fox Sports uh, viewership rights for FIFA competitions. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be any part of that. No. Um, our last story of the day, as you probably saw from the side panel thingamajig, uh, is that Bitcoin hit over $30,000 in the last week or so, uh, hit as high as 33000 and a few hundred dollars, back down to 30000 a day. Uh, this is not a price following show. This is not an investment advice. This is not uh, anything like that. However, we have talked uh, in 2020 about the potential for it. I made a call about a future price target mm -hmm. and uh, I had a bunch of friends text me about it because of that explosive growth upwards and uh, my prediction still roughly holds. Um, there are always corrections in markets like these. You need to anticipate crashes and drops. There's a lot of volatility, particularly with cryptocurrency assets. Um, but a, a crash of $3,000 to a price that was the all-time high as recently as two or three weeks ago is not necessarily cause for um, concern or, or, or nerves or anything like that and uh, is, is something that you need to continue to watch because there is a fantastic amount of energy around the space and we will continue to do that, although there's not much more to say. Just, yeah. to, just to report on the price, if you really care, you already knew that. If you didn't, I, I guess this is really the reason we put it at the end is if you weren't paying attention to the price, mm -hmm. it is worth at least being tangentially aware of. I agree. Cool, that's a rundown. That Just was a missed. major mess. Well, I started and then I got worried about like hitting you or like overgoing and 
Um, Usually it's just a, a, a gentle bob. Yeah. That's a rundown. Thanks for watching. Happy New Year. What's your resolution? My resolution is to get up at 6 a.m. every day. Been lazy about that, but so far so good. What's your resolution? I'm gonna memorize all the countries on the globe. That's. You should update us every, well, maybe not every Monday, but. I already have all of Asia. Damn. And I probably, awesome. I probably have the whole Middle East too. Damn. I um, struggle with Eastern Europe. Yeah. I struggle with um, South Africa. Western Africa. Mm. And, and some of Middle Africa, I've got South Africa down. South Africa is at the very bottom. The countries right above it are Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. There's a small country within South Africa that is Lesotho. Mm. And then you can, I can start to go up and there's you know Angola and <laughs> countries like that. But I'll, maybe it's that'll be- a pretty be, good goal. Yeah. I think maybe at the end of the year, you should just- I think I have all of long. South America too. Damn. So it's it's like Central Central America, Eastern Europe, the western end of Africa, and then like the the Pacific Islands, like Micronesia, Polynesia. Uh, yeah. Those aren't even necessarily like countries, those are like confederations, and right. that's confusing. But yeah. we'll get there. We'll get there. Thanks for watching.